Have you ever experienced something so crippling in your life that has made you feel broken? I have. Are you someone who has a giving heart but is struggling to feel good themselves? Are you consistently putting your needs aside to take care of everyone else? If so, you're not alone. Giving starts with giving to yourself so that you are able to give of yourself to other people. Isn't it time you took back control and discovered what makes you tick? Join me in my journey and find out how you can feel better about yourself, live your best life, and share that with others. Thinking of yourself, it doesn't make you selfish. It makes you brave. I'm Nelia, and this is the Giving Starts With You podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Giving Starts With You podcast. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, it's really, It really humbles me, and it's an honor to have you um, listen. And hopefully this, oper- this community will help you feel um, less lonely. It will help you feel... Um, you know, just part of a community, not, you know, life is so hard um, already, but doing it alone, it's, it's kind of unbearable. So I'm happy to, you know, see you here. And I'm happy that you've tuned in from wherever you are today. I am so excited to have an amazing um, speaker on today. Her name is Michelle Dickinson. She's a well-being strategist. Welcome, Michelle. How are you? I'm awesome. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's thrilling to be here. (laughs) Thank you. Where are you tuning in from? New Jersey. Yes, that's awesome. I love New Jersey. So I'm excited. Let's dive right in. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Michelle. So Michelle Dickinson is a well-being strategist and passionate mental health sorry about that, mental health advocate. She is also a TEDx speaker, um, and you guys should watch that, check it out, because it's pretty powerful, and a published author of a memoir entitled Breaking Into My Life. I love this title, so powerful. Um, Michelle goes first and sees herself as the bridge that helps people get comfortable with their mental health so that they reach out and get the support they need before they hit a crisis. She makes it okay not to be okay and thrives on making a real difference in the lives of others, especially around their well-being. After years of playing the role of child caregiver to her bipolar mother, Michelle embarked on her own healing journey of self-discovery. She went on to spend years working to eradicate the mental health stigma within her own workplace by elevating empathy and compassion, causing more open conversations and leading real change in how mental illness is understood. She was instrumental in building the largest and fastest growing employee mental health employee resource group while at her Fortune 50 company. This is so important to me, especially in the workplace. It can affect so many of us. Um, Michelle also knows firsthand what it's like to struggle with a mental illness after experiencing her own depression due to her divorce. She has provided, this has provided her with a rich perspective. Michelle is out to do her part to eliminate the stigma of normalizing the mental well-being conversation within the workplace and beyond. She partners with innovative leaders to bring them her psychological resilience programs and mental health strategists strategies to recenter employees and cultivate cultures of compassion. Her signature resilience webinar has made a positive impact on thousands of employees during COVID-19. So many topics, so many topics we can talk about today. Um, Yeah, Michelle, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on the show. It's fantastic to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so thrilled. And I always appreciate when people want to talk about this. This is stuff that's not typically very comfortable to talk about. So I really just appreciate that you're like, let's talk about this because it's affecting so many people. Yes. And in turn, it affects their families too. It's not just the person that's struggling. It's the person around them and the whole family unit. It's just, 
I think there's more people struggling today than there has ever been because of COVID-19 and because of all the work from home and all the different things that we we're faced with, right? Let me give you a data point there. 42% of the global workforce has experienced a decline in their mental health since the beginning of the pandemic. Wow. That's a lot. So much change, fear, uncertainty going on, you know. Um, let's start, you know, let's go back a little bit and just, can we hear a little bit about your story and, and why you're passionate about uh, mental illness? Sure, sure. You know, I never imagined I would be talking about this. Um, I, you know, grew up with a mother that had bipolar disorder and I sort of put that on the shelf and carried on with my life. Um but I gave, I was invited, what happened was I was invited to give a TED talk and that pretty much changed everything. Um, growing up with my mom, I experienced her rapid cycling. So anyone who knows about bipolar disorder, there could be rapid cycling. So she had mania and then she had depression. And so that was just the tapestry of my childhood. It was always there. I, I learned how to navigate that. I cared for her throughout my childhood, my young adult life. And, and, um, and yeah, so it shaped me and, and because I came out the other side, was able to get a good job, was able to be a contributing member of society and never really had like issues, I guess you would say, I thought I was okay. I thought I was fine. Um, and so I just focused on my career. I, I got a great job. I was working in, um, a corporate community, like a corporate environment for 19 years of my life. And then all of a sudden someone found out about my story with my mom and nominated me to give this Ted talk. And that was pretty much the pivotal moment for me because I got really connected to the power of storytelling and going first and what happens when you tell your story and how other people almost feel like they have permission to be who they are and relate to you and talk about something. I had never talked about my mom. I'd never talked about the story. So it was very, it was very um, challenging. And, uh, you know, and I'm proud that I was able to find the courage to step on the stage and tell it. So uh, yeah, I gave the TED Talk, got an amazing reaction, realized the power that this story had to make a bigger difference in the world and remove stigma and cause more open conversations. And so then I got real connected with, well, if I could do that in a TED Talk, what if I wrote a book? <laughs> so I sat down and I, and I wrote my book, my memoir, it took me four years and, um, released the book. And at the time I had been, you know, working in the corporate environment and we were building a stigma-free community within, well, stigma-free culture. And so what emerged was a mental health employee resource group that I was a, a leader of with other leaders and, um, and I just got really connected to having there be a safe place for people who either were affected by mental illness or were loving and caring for someone at home with a mental illness, that they had their own community of love and support um, in the place that they worked. So all this happens, I get very connected to wanting to be an outspoken advocate. I'm doing a lot of talks. I'm talking to different organizations about my story and mental health and why we need to talk about it. And um, then my corporate job gets eliminated in a restructuring. Mm. So I'm sort of at like this crossroads and I'm like, well, what do I do? Like I, this is pulling at my heart. This is really pulling at it. Like, this is what I should be doing. Like they say the two most important days of your life, the day you're born and the day you figure out why. <laughs> and I'm not even kidding you. I had finally figured out why I was on the planet and why I lived through my mother's you know, depression. And so that was when I said, you know what, it's time. And that's when I created Trifecta Mental Health. I love that so much. You know, thank you for being brave enough to, to do the TED Talk and, and to, you know, to grow from there. And it is hard. It's hard. You don't know how people are going to accept your story, accept your book. Um, you don't know what people are going to think of you. You don't know how people are going to take things. But, you know, like we said before we hit record and you're not writing it for those people. You're, you will connect. Your message will connect with the right people. The people who need to hear it will hear it. So it doesn't really matter that it doesn't, you know, go across the board. Like we're not here to, you know, please everybody. And right. 
I think it's amazing. Your TED talk is brilliant and it really puts you into the, into the place of, of that moment, you know, that moment in time. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Cause I know it's tough, you know, people come on here and it's tough to, to talk about until you know that you are helping other people with your message. And that really sounds like what you're doing. Oh, so, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So I'm so glad that you have found that, um, you know, the why, right. So yeah. in your business now, um, yeah, I can see that it's going to be remarkable because already you're thinking of the, you know, putting the right things into the workplace yeah. um, to help support um, not only if, if the employee is suffering, but if someone in their family or a friend. Um, many times on this show, it comes through in conversations that it only takes one person to believe in you, you know, and it only takes one person to notice that there's something wrong, whether it's in the workplace or it could be a coworker or a boss or, and they can on, honestly, you know, change the path of where you're going and get that help. So thank you so much for advocating mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. So, yeah. so the obvious thing that sticks in my mind when I hear about um, supporting people at work is that the productivity goes up. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. So yeah. that one is a given to me that clicks right away. What yeah. are some of the other positive things that come out of it? Oh my goodness. Like you bring, you bring your own employees together and like say an employee resource group or a peer community. I mean, they immediately represent hope for other employees. So whether you've navigated depression or not, uh, or whether you are figuring out how to care for that partner at home or loved one at home, you are helping by just representing hope that it's possible because when it's dark and you're in those moments of darkness and you don't know what's, what's available, that's the scary stuff. So when you can see it in your colleagues, they've been able to figure it out. They've been able to navigate it. Oh my goodness, I'm going to be okay. That's huge. Or if they share with you strategies they used, if they talked to you about resources that you didn't even know existed in the company, these are all access points. So I always say bringing a community together within your, your employee population is the best way to support um, your staff. You know, the other benefits, obviously you want engagement, you want people to feel good and feel like they work in a psychologically safe environment um, so that they can stay engaged and stay productive. Ultimately, leaders want to, you know, the bottom line is what matters, but employees who feel safe, it's been proven, feel safe and have a trusting relationship with their boss that they can talk to them, that they could admit if they need a mental health day. These are all benefits. So it just, it makes good business sense to do the right thing by, by your people. And now is such a good opportunity with so many people who are struggling to make a bigger impact on your staff and breed that loyalty um, to keep your, your employees healthy. For sure. And, and even just the simple part of having them show up, like, yeah. you know, I remember, um, you know, having depression myself, it, it all, it, you know, it took so much just to get up in the morning and, and get ready. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to work, you're already exhausted. Yeah. And then people are throwing stuff at you. And it's just a blur sometimes when you're in that, you know, and, and I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but for me, I became um, comfortable in the darkness because it was, it was something I knew more than anything else. So it's very hard to get out of unless you have help. Safe. It's a safe space. I mean, and they say, so I was diagnosed with depression. That's the other piece of my story I didn't mention. Um, you mentioned it in the intro, I was going through divorce and I was diagnosed with depression and like you, I didn't want to get out of bed. And the last thing I wanted to do was talk to people. You think I want to talk to someone, but you know, it's in those moments that I realized through therapy and through building my own toolbox of resilience, it's in those darker moments that we need to reach out and talk to somebody. We need to like, at least get it out of our heads and verbalize how we're doing, mm. um, as much as we don't want to, because then we sort of prevent ourselves from ruminating in our minds and making it 10 times worse than whatever it is we're, we're thinking about. So, so yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. 
I appreciate you saying that because, you know, for a long time, um, I can only speak from experience. I can't speak for you or for anybody who, who's listening. But um, for a long time, I would wait for somebody to come and save me and would be stuck in the same place until realized, look, I, I'm not, I don't like where I'm at. Yes, I do need maybe somebody to point it out to me if you're in that space. But um, I need nobody's coming like I need to save myself too. So it, it it's tough, you know, but if, if you're working somewhere, and you're just, you know, the productivity is low, and you're just not wanting to show up and people are talking to you and you sort of like I know I had a lot of out of body experiences and just stress and everything. It you can't really move forward. You know, you go to work and I feel like it could be the safest place in your universe. Yeah. You know, there could be so many things. It's like with kids going to school. Sometimes that's their safest place, you know. Absolutely. So when COVID hit and you're no longer able to go to work or yeah. maybe in place, you know, there's so many struggles. Like, you know, I know you talk about that because you're now eliminating your most comfortable place. You know, so how do you deal with that? Like, how do you, there's so many changes and I don't know, there's just so much, so much yeah. to talk about. I just, yeah. <laughs> so, so this is a perfect example of what I teach in my resilience program, because so many people were at home working from home, they were isolated. And, and that's why I had the, the opportunity to make a difference for so many people throughout COVID is we were connecting through Zoom and I was just sharing some basic resilience things that they could be doing day to day. The reality is, um, you know, when we focus on what's been pulled from us, when we focus on our freedoms being pulled, our routines being pulled, we focus on loss of life, we loss of money, loss of whatever. When, when we're focusing on all of that that's missing, broken or wrong, um, that just is going to be where our where our attention goes is where our energy flows. So we have to do a better job of choosing where we put our energy, where we put our effort. So it really is, it has a lot to do with what is your daily routine? Are you reflecting in the morning on how you're feeling and how you're doing? And if you're not feeling good, are you admitting it to yourself and then maybe doing something that you know is going to help you? not feel worse, whether it's go for a walk or pick up the phone and call your girlfriend or, you know, um, I don't know, eat that, eat, eat that breakfast that you want. I don't know, like whatever that is, do you know, are you present to how you're feeling? And do you have a go-to that you're going to do? So, you know, that you're going to start to feel a little bit better, you know? And then it's also, when I say where our, our attention goes, our energy flows by Dr. Wayne Dyer, by the way, you can also look at it as, Let's get present to what's good. Are we doing gratitude? Are we doing a gratitude practice? What are, what are three things that we're grateful for? And it doesn't have to be hard. It could literally be something you do when you wake up in the morning, you open your eyes and you're truly just present to how soft your pillow is on your neck. It doesn't have to be like, well, I have a roof over my head and, and I'm breathing. No, it could literally be, what are the little things that bring you joy, that make you happy? Is it the first sip of the coffee? Whatever it is. And just get present to that because that's where the momentum is going to go if we can get into a regular routine of gratitude. Um, and then I have a whole host of other tools that we can do daily to just start feeling like we're back in the cockpit of our lives. We're, we're, we have control. We have more control than we like to believe. Um, and so that's, that's really what has been the motor behind why I do this work is to remind people um, how to, how to preserve their wellness through simple daily things. I love that because it's very, it sounds very actionable, you know, for the people that are struggling. It's not, you know, sometimes the smallest steps are the biggest steps because they allow you to continue on to the next one. Sometimes when you try too much too fast, you shut it down. Right. So no, that's great. Um, you know, it's funny because when we do go into work, we're like, oh, you know, some of us, you don't want to go to work. But then when you're working at home, you're like, oh, yay, I'm working at home. But then you don't have that schedule. And most human right. beings thrive on that schedule, right? right? So it's like, then you're falling apart. And you're like, oh, I want to go back to work. Like everything is just so opposite from what you anticipated it to be. Or, or even worse, before we went live, we were talking about burnout. Even worse is that you don't realize 
that because you don't have boundaries in place, like the bookends of the day, driving to work, driving home, yes. you're, working, you're working around the clock. And, and if you look at the data, I don't remember which report this came out of, there's actually more burnout with people working from home because they're working longer hours mm. and because it's more convenient for them to grab dinner and then come back to work. So we have, we are the ones that have control over establishing those boundaries of, I will work from this time to this time. And then I'm stepping away and going back into my life and dealing, you know, taking care of my, my family and taking care of myself. So burnout is a very big problem, especially during COVID because I mean, a majority of people are very dedicated and working, you know, way too many hours. Yeah, I can see that for sure. I'm glad you brought that up. And the bookends of the day. Wow. I love that. <laughs> I honestly, I love that so much because it just, you know, there's, we, we look at everything as a start and an end, right? And we have this little compartment that we put everything in. And it's true. Like I know when I work from home, it just never ends because there's always something else, always something else. And even if you get up and go, it's hard to turn it off. And once you do suffer from burnout, it's so hard to feel better. Like once you're there and, you know, we have to, we have to learn all these things that you're teaching before we get to the burnout stage, because it's so much more difficult once you hit it. So let's talk about compounding stress, because that's exactly what can cause burnout. When we have compounded stress and we're not finding an outlet to release that, if you think about it, the body is just not going to have a place to allow that to go. If we're not thinking about a daily process, whether it's a meditation or an exercise routine or something that can help dissipate that. So we have to do a better job of making it a regular practice to preserve our, our emotional and mental well-being. Because I say this to the women, I, I point to the women mostly when I say this. There is no amount of a six hour spa day that is going to resolve six months of stress. So stop thinking that way. What's your daily practice to care for yourself? And don't, don't hang it on the shelf for the spa day that's coming in six months. Cause that's never going to really resolve what you're dealing with. Um, any dis ease in the body is very likely to create disease. So we have to, we have to manage that through you know, exercise, yoga, meditation, clearing our minds, going for a walk. We have to own that daily. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, for saying that I agree like a hundred percent. I was just talking the other day, how it's not how much time you have, like you're saying the six hour spa, you know, it's taking 15 minutes yeah. and what you're doing with that 15 minutes, you know, like most of us can't find a whole afternoon or can't yeah. find, you know, there's so many things that we're, we're going through. And I know that you mentioned as well on your website, you know, we all have like um, caregiving roles and children and work and all these things that are, are you know, our responsibilities. It's hard to find the, those few minutes. So it's what you do with that time. I think by the time you get to the point of booking that six hour spot, you're like way past way. the point of being due. Way. Like, right. yeah, like you won't get the benefits. You, you really won't appreciate the benefits because you'll be like, oh my God, that's it. That's all I get. Well, it's like self-care is not selfish and something we should be making a priority and scheduling on our calendar every single day. So do you feel like that? Cause maybe you had a time in your life where you were neglecting your self-care. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I told you before we went live about how I spent 19 years in a corporate environment that was very much like you do A, you do B, and then you do C, and then you, you log off. Like that was the routine. And now as an entrepreneur, it's very easy to burn out because all we want to do is work around the clock, you know, with people like Gary Vaynerchuk saying, grind, grind, grind. And at the end of the day, you can't, I say, we, we have to learn to flow. So for me in the beginning, I was just working every day and working in the evenings and not making myself a priority. Now it's like, no matter what is going on, Sunday is my day for me. Sunday is my day, no matter what. And then I have my, my like routine during the week that includes, you know, morning meditation, exercising, um, yoga, these are things, oh my gosh, don't get me started on yoga. Yoga is the most nourishing thing you can do for your body and for your mind. 
So these are things that I do daily, but then I also just like Sundays, I just, they, they're for me. I, and I make that a priority because I want to come back on Monday refreshed. Mm. So, because I know what it feels like and, and you're right. Like before you know it, you're burned out. And so I was just as guilty as the next entrepreneur trying to get in that extra, you know, few hours thinking that was going to make a difference when I was depleting myself. So that doesn't work. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that too, because, you know, some of the listeners, uh, many of the listeners um, are just starting off, you know, their own businesses. And it's so easy to hustle, hustle, hustle. You know, I'm guilty of that too. Yeah. And it's, it's more, instead of checking things off the list, because that list will never end. It's more about balance and figuring it out. And sometimes that's the hardest part when you start a business because, you know, you've got to like have the processes in order and, and, and the, the schedule where, you know, that's part of it, right? That's part of being an entrepreneur is making up your own schedule. So mm -hmm. don't neglect all the things that you said once when you were at a job saying, oh, if I, you know, I could just take this break right now if I need it, or I could, you know, we don't follow through with all the reasons sometimes. So I appreciate that very much. You know, it's it, it, it also starts with the to-do list. I mean, how many of us have a list that's 20, 20 things long? And just by looking at it, you're overwhelmed and you're defeated at the beginning of the day. So let's be realistic about what are the two or three must do's that I'm going to get done today. So I'm not setting myself up for instant stress and overwhelm and nowhere near going to accomplish all of this. So we have to be realistic in the, in the expectations we're setting every day. Yeah, it, it's so true. We're never going to get everything done. You know, I like to think of, I've stopped doing to-do lists and I've started more actionable goals. I think of it as, so it's like over the week, this is what, you know, this is the goal that I want to accomplish. Right. So I'm not so hard on myself when I go from one day to the next, if every little thing isn't marked off yeah. and I'm not afraid to ask for help now. See, I had the reason why I asked you if, if you had neglected your self-care before is because mm -hmm. normally advocates of self-care are people who know and have been on the other side and that's me as well I was taking care of so many people around me that I was just, I was just like oh I'm not I, I'm just as important but I'm really not because I'm not reflecting that in what I'm doing and then I hit burnout and it's hard to get out of it really is and especially when you're at the work you know when you're working whether you're an entrepreneur or you are um, in a corporate you know corporate America um, it is hard to shut it down and to feel um, appreciated. So you have to, if you don't do it for yourself, who's going to come to your rescue and, and yeah. you know? It's the, you know, it's the oxygen mask. People say to me, you know, well, what, you know, what do you, what advice do you have for caregivers? And this is your a story is a perfect story. I mean, you cannot help anyone else out if you don't take care of you. It really is the oxygen mask. Put your mask on first so you can have the strength and the patience that you would want to show up for the ones that you love that you're trying to care for. Don't think that, you know, depleting yourself in, in the name of helping them is going to help anyone. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you really do, you know, do something for you so you get to show up and care to the caliber you want to care for them uh, is so critical. It took me a long time to think, to, to believe in that. Yeah. Like, you know, the whole put your mask. I'm like, what do you mean? Like my child's sitting here in an airplane with me and, you know, I'm watching the stewardess do all the things and sitting on a plane. I'm like, no, my, my kid's going to get the oxygen first. Like that, you know, it took me a long time till I actually played out the scenario in my mind, you know, and a lot of people um, are not advocating in the workplace. So I'm so happy that you're doing this yeah. because I see it changing a lot of things. Yeah. You know, I see it changing, not only the relationship in at work, but coming home different, coming home not with, you know, heavy shoulders and coming home, maybe, you know, refreshed instead of depleted from your day and be like, yeah. okay, I know I'm going home to this situation, you know, whether it's bipolar or alcoholism or, you know, depression, you know, someone in my family perhaps, or, but I'm okay. I can figure this out. 
Yeah. You know, I've learned these things today. I know I've got someone at work or someone on my side that I can talk about it if I need to. Right. You no, know, it really does affect everything. And mm-hmm. I do believe that when you help one person, you help everyone. Yes. You know, so like, yeah, it's just, you help, like for me, once I felt better, I, my whole family was better. Yeah. The community was better. Yes. You know, then yes. I was able to reach out and start helping more people. You know, yes. when you felt better, you yes. felt better about yourself. You're able to create this movement now mm-hmm. where you're teaching other people. So it's fantastic. We have to, we have to listen to these things. We have you to, know, you're, re- you're making me think about how it's so important for us to recognize that someone who might be struggling with anxiety, depression, or some type of a mental health imbalance, um, to have to go into a workplace where they have to pretend that they're not struggling. And I'm not saying like go into work and like vomit all over everyone, what you're dealing with. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, shouldn't we all have a place where we can go and bring our our authentic selves and not feel like we have to hide the fact that we're dealing with something? Because all that does is adds another layer of pressure and stress and anxiety on top of what we're dealing with. So wouldn't it behoove an organization and leaders to create and cultivate a psychologically safe environment, a culture of compassion and understanding where there was a normal narrative around emotional well-being and mental health, that there was no shame in just acknowledging, you know what, today I'm having, today I'm having a down day. I, I, you know, I'm whatever I have depression, but like, yesterday I rocked it. Today's not a good day, but to be able to just be you, I mean, that's, that's what we should be striving for because when we can normalize the narrative in the workplace, then it doesn't feel like a place you go and you have to pretend you're something that you're not. And, and then you get the best out of people because they're bringing all of themselves and they're accepted. And I mean, isn't that all we ever want is to be accepted for who we are, understood, and and um, have our skills, our unique skills and attributes, um, be able to come to the surface. I mean, so that's why it's so important to me. Is like I when I was struggling with depression, I did go first. I did tell my boss. I did. I had the courage. I was like, listen, I'm dealing with depression. It is not easy. I'm going to do the best I can. I don't want to go out on disability. And then in my performance review, she said to me, you didn't bring your bubbly and upbeat self to work every day. And I'm like, you are the problem. Mm. Oh my goodness. You're the problem. Can can we have a little bit of more compassion, understanding? Like I took something for me to own that and tell Mm. you it took something. And then I get that back at me, but it just goes to prove there's work to be done to have people understand that we can lead with compassion. We can absolutely do that um, and still be effective and and accomplish our goals. Yeah, I had a similar experience too with work, you know, you don't know what people are dealing with. Um, So if productivity goes down or, you know, people are acting out of character, you know, ask rather than, you know, I had a situation too at my job where um, I was going through some things and, and I came to work and I didn't do what you did. So here's the difference. So even though you did it, they didn't really acknowledge it. Okay. But that's not on you. That's on them. Right. (laughs) For me, I didn't really speak up and say, so nobody knew. Um, but it came back on a performance review that, you know, productivity was going down and what was going on. And then I still couldn't bring myself. I didn't have that bravery to say something. Yeah. Yeah. But it's tough because in your situation, I feel bad that it wasn't reciprocated. Like the person didn't understand. So here you are telling them your story and they didn't. So more reason for you to now do what you're doing. Right. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there are amazing uh, bosses out there. Yes. Will will say, well, how can I make this transition easier for you? What do you yeah. need from me? And that is everything. You know, when we're growing up, <laughs> we have our parents to lean on. Yes. We have our teachers. You know, when we're adults, it's just us. Right. <laughs> like if, who else do you have? Your boss. You know, if you're working, right. you have an employer, right? right? So if you can't go to them, who else is there? If your family is already in chaos and struggling, you can't really go to them either. And then 
you know, if you go to people in your close circle, maybe they grew up the same as you, so they can't really help you. Right. So where do you go? Right. So, right. yeah. So I'm, yeah. I'm so happy that you're doing this. Can I just tell you, there are a couple of things I want to mention that of you just, that, that you said, like the thing. So I had worked with um, really early in the pandemic, some amazing clients. And one of the things they kept coming back to and saying to me is, this is such great training for our employees, but like, can you help our people leaders? Because our people leaders don't know how to engage with an employee if they notice a shift in their behavior. There's so much trepidation around that, that they just look the other way, or even worse, what you said, they start to manage someone who they sense might be struggling from a performance perspective, instead of becoming curious as to what's really going on that is having you have performance issues. Because the big mistake is that we manage mental health challenges from a performance perspective. That is just something that we really need to wake people up to. So there's that. And so I developed the, the workshop that I now deliver to leaders to help them understand there is a safe way to engage. There are things you can be doing along the way that cultivates trust. Um, there are simple observations you can make that are not going to be intrusive. They're going to be curious and they're going to come from a caring lens. Mm. And most important, their biases. So in the case where the woman said to me, you know, you didn't bring your bubbly up itself to work today. I, in that moment, couldn't see beyond the upset. But when I took right. a step back, I realized what's her relationship to her own mental health? What's her relationship to well-being and to depression? If I tell you I'm depressed, what comes up in her mind? So just like all these biases we bring to the table in our workplace of our life experiences that we have, whether or not we want to acknowledge them. We also have biases around how we relate to someone with a mental illness mm -hmm. that is the foundation of being a good leader. Let's check your relationship to mental illness. Like, did you have someone in your life that you loved, that you watched struggle? Do you have no relationship to it? Do you relate to it as a gun shooting in a school? God forbid. Like, what is your relationship? Because True. that's going to have you manage and lead people in a very, very different way. So that's why I, I do the work I do with leaders is to get them present to, you know, their own stuff and then help them have confidence in extending themselves to their own people. Yeah, because sometimes it's not that they're trying to be rude or crass or they just don't know. They don't. They, they don't. don't. And um, a lot of people do have a relationship with it, but many don't. And they have no clue. Like some people could be thinking, oh, rolling their eyes. Well, here's another one, you know, who's come to me with this problem. Or somebody else could be like, wow, I'm really, you know, afraid because my brother killed himself. Or you just don't know where they're coming from. So I think this is so important. And just to, yeah, just to have a safe place, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my own girlfriend, this is an interesting story. I tell this story all the time. My own girlfriend was like, so I don't understand what, what are you doing? You're, you're trying to create more compassion in the workplace. Like she was so confused. Right. And she said right. to me, um, you know, but even if I have an employee who's struggling, the widgets still have to get made. And I said, okay. I said, what if this employee is someone who's been dedicated, worked really hard for you, and you really do want to make sure they're okay? Mm. Well, that's fine. Like, I guess if they have to go out and they have to take care of themselves, that's fine. But who's going to make the widgets? And I go, oh my goodness. Like, like I, I, I was so frustrated with her. And I go, I go, uh, Cindy, I go, Cindy. I said, do you believe that mental, mental health and mental illness is legit or is it like a cop-out or an excuse? And she said to me, I don't know. And I said to myself, wow, like how many people have it mm -hmm. that mental health issues are a cop-out? You're weak. It's an excuse. You're looking to get out of work. How many other leaders have that perspective and are leading from that lens? Scary, isn't it? It's very scary. And she was my friend. And I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's so scary. I wrote about that in my book, how mental illness can be perceived as laziness in the work. Yes. Because it's just like, oh, they just don't want to do the work. Oh, they just don't want, you know, yeah. but like in one way it frustrates me, but in another way, it's not their fault that they're not educated about it. They right. can become educated about it so they can change. Definitely. So right. I don't want to say it's not their fault, but 
I'm happy that they haven't had to deal with those things in their life that um, they're not familiar. But when you're an employee or you're a leader, you need to get familiar. Yeah. Because most people (laughs) nowadays, most people do have some form. I find it's, it's so much more out there. You know, and people are talking about it more. You need to have those skills in order to be a boss or a good boss. And, and the widgets will get made if you take care of your people, you know? Exactly. Exactly. It's so true. And I actually had another conversation with a gentleman that wanted to collaborate with me. And I thought to myself, this is not going to be a good partnership because he was like, he was like, I never had to deal with any of that. You know, I just, I just tough it up and power through. He's like, I I don't, I don't have to deal with any of that mental health stuff. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm strong. And I was like, wow. So now the perspective is you're strong. Everyone else is weak. So your perspective on mental health is very, very different than mine. Uh, And not everyone has the ability to power through or be in denial, which it sounds like you might be. (laughs) Yeah. So rather than working with you, I think you might need to take my course. I think so. (laughs) Yeah, Because it's true. It's perceived as weak or not good enough or, and you know, it's sad. Yeah. Sad to me because when you're the person that's struggling and going through it and you feel alone and you hear things like that, it is such an insult. It is. And such a, I don't know how to say it. It just makes me sad. It creates hopelessness is what it does. It creates hopelessness. It has us feel like, wow, you know, and and a job oftentimes, if we're not careful, can define us. So if there's that shakiness in that experience of employment can really rock us at our core yeah you know I needed this conversation today Aww. I did um I'm struggling a bit with my with my day job and um my moral issues and things and I needed to hear that so thank you you're welcome um I usually not usually but sometimes I ask my guests this question um what would you say is the biggest gift that you have ever given to yourself that has changed the way you look at yourself and feel about yourself? Well, I mean, I put myself through a lot of self-discovery work that has, that work has been a gift to me to get to know me and try to figure out why I am the way I am. I would say those courses were, but most recently, I will tell you on a journey to self-love, The whole experience of just doing yoga has really woken me up to, to loving myself. So I have to say yoga most recently and the self-discovery work I've done throughout the years, whether it was landmark or Tony Robbins work all got me very present to who, who I am. And I think that's an important gift before you can help others. You have to know who you are. Yeah. And before you started yoga, did you ever think it was something you would get into? Like, how did you get introduced to it? You know, I did yoga a few years ago. It felt really great. And I was like, yeah, I can do this. Okay. It's not as fast as I'd like it to be. But then like, I was talking to a friend that I just interviewed a, a gentleman on my mental health series, <clears throat> Michelle's conversations that matter. And he was just telling me about how it helped him. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like they say that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Oh. And so my listening about yoga had shifted in our conversation, which reminds me, I need to thank him. And so I just started doing it and I started to really appreciate getting in touch and getting in tune with my body and my mind. So that one person that can call us out on something and can change everything, you know, thank you for being that one person, you know, in your, in your community to like, try to get all these messages out and just just inform people and educate people you know when you go through something like you did growing up and with your divorce and everything it it just becomes clear like you said your why it just meshes together and you know when you when you reach the other side of understanding and forgiveness and all these things then all you want to do is help somebody in your situation it's like wait 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 I can help you like I know what you're going through you know and and it's 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 amazing I love when people take their adversities and change it to help other people so thank you you're welcome yeah it helps us to help other people absolutely it does yeah it continues our healing too right totally 
Yeah. Yeah. Did you find that when you wrote your book too, that it helped heal and helped you open up about everything? So very, very cathartic. It took me four years. I had a writing coach who like insisted that I relive some of these experiences. And in order to put pen to paper and have the reader with me in that journey, I had to close my eyes and go to some of the painful moments, Mm. but it was so cathartic to do it. Yeah. I had to step away a few times and just give myself a break. Um, very, very cathartic to write it, but now I've gotten so many people wanting the audio book. So now, um, I'm in the process of turning this into an audio book cover. Love it. So Thank you. So I'm, I'm actually, I have a little bit of, of nervousness around it because I know that reading these chapters, just like when I was going through the editing process was still very moving to me. So this was in 2018 and now we're in 2021 and I'm going to record it with my voice and actually read the pages again. So I'm a little anxious about it, but I am going to take people on that journey as I record it and relive the book. Um, So you want to follow me for that because that's going to be a very interesting experience for me. Yeah. I can't wait to read it. I love the title uh, breaking into my life. It's powerful. And I love the art, the artwork that you have on there. Um, it took me 15 years to write mine. Wow. But I, I say that, but it was, I would write, my father died at Christmas. So Christmas Eve, everybody would go to bed and I would, okay, pull it out again. And then it would be so hard. I'd put it away mm-hmm. and a year later. So I say 15 years, but it was like a day, a year for, you know, several <laughs> years. <laughs> you know? And I thought of doing an audio book as well. But I couldn't every time I tried to read it, I would start to sob, you know, so I had somebody else record mine because I just couldn't do it. But Mm -hmm. yeah, power to you like that's going to be so touching and so beautiful. I see uh, you have a little dog in the background. He's so cute. I have, three. I have three and I'm just praying that they stay quiet. I have, I have a Corgi and two Jack Russells. So I'm praying. Oh, no one yeah, the Jack over. Russells can be yucky, right? <laughs> I used to have one. I have a pug who's pretty loud himself when he walks across the floor, just like boom, boom, you know, but is there anything we didn't touch on today that you wanted to get across? Just make sure that you're, you're checking in on yourself. I think we get so busy in our day-to-day lives that we're not really present to how we're doing. And so the best way to preserve your mental health is to just always be present to how you're doing and feeling and know what to do to feel better. Um, so you don't slip into, you know, something more serious. And if you do feel like you aren't feeling well, have no shame in reaching out and talking to someone like that's my biggest message. Like so many people are in therapy now they're talking to someone and it's okay so just it's okay to not be okay is probably one of my biggest messages it, the brain is just an organ let's let's get it the care it needs so that we're feeling good yeah absolutely and it's okay to change therapists if yeah. you don't have a connection with someone don't stay that's more stress and more worry right. you know it's okay and they expect that yeah. You know, so find somebody you can trust because otherwise it will shut down again and then right. you have to start the process. So thank you so much. Um, yeah. Where can we find you? Where can we learn from you? Yeah. Yes. Follow me on Instagram. It's at Michelle Dickinson 71. Um, and you can also, you can get a free chapter of my book at breaking into my life.com. <laughs> but if you are wanting to bring change to your culture, if you really want to help your employees with the resilience, if you want to help their leader, your leaders lead better, lead with more compassion, not have trepidation around helping their people, you'll go to my website, careforyourpeople.com and um, connect with me there. Thank you. I'm You're glad welcome. to read your book. Awesome. Thank it's you. Great. <laughs> Thanks so much. I know you're a busy girl and I really appreciate you coming on and and teaching us today and making us feel, you know, more prepared, like just one step closer to, um, to getting it right, you know, and if you're the boss, pay attention, you know, pay attention. It's not just about the bottom line, you know? Yeah. So thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me, Mila. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. If you enjoyed what you heard, please subscribe or leave a review. See you next week on the Giving Starts With You podcast.